Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Saba. And today we're investigating a fundamental concept in statistics, that is the central limit theorem, that is at the heart of why the normal distribution is used so much in applied statistics and in its financial applications. That is, why do we generally assume that stock returns follow normal distributions and so on and so forth? And the central limit theorem is key at understanding this assumption of many models, including Markowitz modern portfolio theory, the Black-Scholes option valuation formula, and so on and so forth. However, today we will investigate the central limit theorem in an applied way using graphs and numerical simulations on a much simpler case, that is, dice throws. And uh, we will simulate a thousand dice throws with varying numbers of dice that are involved in our simulations. So we will throw 30 dice and see how the overall score that we obtain from a throw varies across our 1000 simulations. And obviously, modeling a die throw is quite simple. Uh, one particular die can uh, uniformly return any integer from 1 to 6. You're as likely to roll a 1 as you are to roll a 2, a 3, or 4, a 5, or a 6. So here we can use a simple rand between function and return a random number between 1 and 6 for each of the independent dice throws. And obviously we assume they are independent simply because those dice don't really care about each other, isn't it, in any of our simulations. And now let's populate our large table with those random independent dice throws and see how this score uh, depends on the number of dice and how the distribution changes and whether it converges to something beautiful and nice and whether the central limit theorem really holds. And here we can see that in our very first random variable realization, the very first die throw, we have scored a 1. And that's perfectly random. We could add as well, scored a 5 or a 6, but it's just how the random numbers turned out. And uh, this function is quite simple and quite useful, simply because we can just drag it all the way across and see that these are our first 30 die throws, and in this particular random variable realization, our 30 die throws, we have scored a total of 103 points, so 103 overall score, and on average, one die throw uh, yielded us 3.43 on average, which is slightly lower than 3.5 that you theoretically expect from a die throw, it means that this particular throw was slightly unlucky. But we'll repeat that a thousand times by just bottom like clicking this formula all the way down, and that populates the whole table with 30,000 individual dice throws. And as this uh, random variables uh, do uh, recalculate every single time we input something new onto the Excel spreadsheet to save on our operating memory, we'll just copy and paste those as values so, they, so that they don't change at all since. And now let's consider the cumulative uh, running total sums overall scores of throws of 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on up to 30 dice. And this can be coded quite easily in Excel just using the sum function. And here for one die, we'll just consider this particular realization, so 5, and we'll lock the column over here and go to cell B2 without locking it over here. And this will return the cumulative sum of n dice as we drag it all the way to the right. It means that as we drag it, we'll get the cumulative sum of 2, 3, 4, and so on dice throws. And here we can as well use Ctrl R to drag this formula all the way to the right and bottom left click it, populating the whole table as well. And we see that here, for, the, for example, we have got a score of 5 throwing 1 dice, score of 11 having thrown 2 dice, we're quite lucky so far, score of 16 having thrown 3 dice in a row, which means that we are still quite lucky, score of 18 throwing 4 dice, and so on. And now let's uh, 
deal with the overall dynamics of our random simulations and see where it takes us. So the first thing that we can consider is to calculate the moments of these um, random uh, distributions of scores in our simulations, uh, namely the mean, the standard deviation, skewness, and curtises. And uh, how does it help us to visualize the central limit theorem in action? Well, first of all, mean and standard deviation scaling with the increase of a number of independent variables that you consider uh, can help you visualize what's going on in many financial implications, including something like value at risk or just return and risk scaling over longer time periods. We all know that we can scale returns linearly, basically just multiplying them by the number of uh, days or any other periods in question. And standard deviation scales as a square root. So, for example, if you want to annualize your daily standard deviation, you multiply it by the square root of 252, isn't it? Simply because there are 252 trading days in a year. And to scale average return for average annual return, you just multiply by 252 instead. And here we can visualize that and see whether it holds on our purely random simulation with dice. So, for example, for the mean, we can just calculate the average of all 1,000 uh, single dice throws. We can calculate the standard deviation using the stdv.s function, sample standard deviation function, and get uh, 1.75. So we can see that actually the mean is quite close to what we have theoretically uh, been expecting of 3.5, and the standard deviation is uh, approximately 1.7, which is also quite close to the theoretical value. And uh, for skewness and courtesies, we expect those to slowly converge to zeros, so the values that you normally expect from a normal distribution, as we increase the number of dice in our throw. So as we go from one dice in a throw to 30 dice in a throw, those should go to zero as we progress. And we can tr keep track of that by just using the skew function to calculate the skewness, and it's very close to zero uh, al already, simply because those random variables are indeed symmetric, as we have got no um, upside or downside in throwing a dice, those are perfectly symmetric outcomes. However, with courtesies, we will initially get a negative value, and we can see that we have a value of minus 1.34, simply because our tails of the random distribution of dice throws are quite cut off as it's bounded from below and above. You cannot, in any case, throw uh, a score of lower than one or higher than six if you throw one dice. However, this will smoothen out and resemble, uh, to greater and greater extents, the tails of the normal distribution with courtesies approaching zero as we increase the number of our dice in a simulation. And to verify that, we can just drag those all the way to the right and keep track of our moments as we approach 30 dice throws. So here we can see that if we increase the dice throws in a particular uh, simulation from 1 to 30, our courtesies, if we plot it using a simple line chart, does indeed increase from minus 1.34 and then starts fluctuating around zero. That's what you would expect as per the central limit theorem, as zero is a theoretical value consistent with a normal distribution, so it means that our distribution of uh, cumulative scores is approaching normality to greater and greater extents as you include more and more independent and identically distributed random variables into the picture, which is good. Our skewness, if you visualize that, also does fluctuate around zero uh, to some great extent. However, it's not as um, illustrative as with courtesies, as skewness is theoretically zero for all of those cases, so we would not uh, consider it uh, as much as with the courtesies. And if we uh, deal with our mean and standard deviation, we can see that if we divide the mean of 30 throws onto the mean of one throw, we get a value that's very close to 30, meaning that the mean does indeed scale linearly, as we uh, do assume in uh, various financial applications. And if we do divide the standard deviation for 30 throws onto the standard deviation of one throw, we get 5.24. And if we square that, we again get a number that's quite close to 30, meaning that standard deviation does scale as a square root as per many assumptions uh, involving financial applications. However, the most um, illustrative way of visualizing the convergence to normality as per the central limit theorem is to visualize the um, histogram or just the chart of how many times 
do we get a particular score in our 1000 simulations? How often does a particular score occur in such 1000 simulations? And theoretically, we can get a score of uh, down from 1, if we just throw 1 dice and get unlucky, to a score of 180, if we throw 30 dice and each of those return a 6. It's highly unlikely, but still possible. And here we can just use a count if function, keeping track of how often a particular realization occurs. So we can count those particular scores, locking the rows here, and referring to the points total in this column over here, locking the column. And we can see that for one dice, um, as uh, probably expected from common sense, uh, we have got quite evenly spread uh, realizations from one uh, point all the way up to six points. And it's impossible to score higher than seven or below one for just one dice, as one might imagine. So here it is just as expected. But what happens if we increase the number of dice in our throw? So we can just drag it across and then bottom left click it all the way down as usual, and then visualize the points scored against the number of realizations where such a score occurs. So we can just simply visualize it using a line chart. And here we can see this particular uh, case where there is no real pattern. Um, those do fluctuate across um, around 160, 170 for just one dice throw. And to make this figure even more understandable, we can label the axes as the score uh, on the x-axis and uh, number of realizations on the y-axis and then we can just drag that and see how this chart, how this distribution evolves as we include more and more dice into our throw. So for two dice, something uh, interesting already emerges. We have got a quite clear peak around seven, which is the most likely and the average outcome of two dice throw, as uh, on average one dice returns 3.5, so two quite naturally returns seven on average. And that is indeed the most likely realization with other events being much less likely. If we move even further to three dice, we can see that first of all, our chart does wander to the right hand side simply because the sum of more dice thrown is greater. However, the peak of the distribution gets smoother and smoother as we increase the number of dice thrown. And that's already a good showcase of the central limit theorem in action. And as we go further and further, we can see how uh, with the graph crawling to the right, the peak of the distribution gets smoother and smoother, with uh, less of this peakedness that we um, saw, spotted with two dice thrown being still there for more and more dice. And as we go all the way to 30 dice thrown, we can see something that is very closely resembling the normal distribution curve, the bell curve, given the fact that we've got the most likely realizations around the mean, around 100.5, in this case, the most likely is 104, which is quite close to 105, which is theoretically uh, expected. And uh, we have got many uh, other realizations around this 105 sweet spot that are also very likely. And uh, the tails of the distribution are quite well behaved and quite thin, with the curtises that's close to zero resembling that as well. And uh, the central limit theorem in action says the following. As we've got more and more independent and identically distributed random variables with finite variance, the sum or the average of their realizations will tend to normal distributions as the number of such variables tends to infinity. And uh, that's exactly what happens in financial applications. If you imagine a stock and try to model its daily return, uh, the daily change in the market value of a company, for example, then you can imagine that there are hundreds, thousands, or perhaps even millions of uh, seemingly independent events that happen, each yielding some impact on corporate value. Something can happen in the macroeconomy, something can happen with the competitors, something can happen in terms of the political risk or regulation or whatever can happen overall in this world. And some of these events might be quite lucky or quite beneficial for the company. Imagine you throw one dice and score more than 3.5. You score a 5, you score a 6. Shareholders are pleased. Or some of those events, uh, albeit independent from previous ones, can be quite uh, detrimental for the company. Imagine rolling a 1 or a 2 being unlucky with your 
dice throw or this random event. And if you are willing to take this leap of faith and assume that those thousands and millions of events are independent, identically distributed, and uh, with finite variants, which are by no means um, intuitive assumptions, then you can use this theoretical concept of the central limit theorem to resort to normal distribution and the normality assumption in modeling various financial concepts from, again, portfolio theory to even option valuation. And the reason why the normality assumption that is sounding quite good in theory does not often uh, stand true empirically is that one of those presumptions of the central limit theorem are not fulfilled themselves. The events that happen to a company might not be independent, might not be identically distributed, and they might be explosive. They might not have finite variants. And uh, perhaps most clearly, sometimes when a stock is traded illiquidly or not many people care about the stock, it's quite obscure, then there might not be enough throws to progress from some weird peaked curve to something more well-behaved and resembling normal distribution. And that's all there is regarding the central limit theorem, its visualization using dice throws, and some rationales for why it might or might not be applicable in financial concepts. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I need to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.